Hey class. Uh, okay, so today is the last uh, normal lecture of the semester. Uh, on Wednesday, I will post the exam three review. Um, and then uh, Wednesday's lecture will, will consist of a presentation of a project and its structure. Uh, and it'll include the API uh, for the back end. It'll be uh, written in C sharp. Uh, so if you're not familiar with it, then this will be a good exposure to you. Uh, the front end will consist of a uh, React uh, project, uh, React.js, um, which is a framework, a JavaScript framework provided by uh, the developers at Facebook. Um, and uh, the, uh, the database uh, that supports the persistence of data uh, and that'll be in Postgres. Uh, and the back end, which is written in C Sharp, uh, will be written against .NET Core. Uh, and it'll use uh, an entity framework core uh, object relational mapping. Uh, and so all, all of this is really jargon. <laughs> uh, but the idea is that I want you to see how uh, the front end relates to the back end, and the back end relates to uh, the uh, database, uh, and how uh, it, it really all connects. Um, and uh, for those of you that uh, have never built a website, uh, which would have been myself uh, when I was an undergraduate student, um, this will be good exposure. Uh, every tool that uh, I will use or that I use in this project uh, will uh, be freely available. So it's something that um, if you wanted to, you could, uh, you could install on your laptops or, or desktops at home. Uh, and you could uh, recreate the project. Uh, I'll be sure to post the source code somewhere that it's available. Uh, and uh, if it goes as planned, <laughs> then uh, you'll see how to create it uh, at each step along the way. Uh, and hopefully it'll be explained well enough that you can adapt it uh, so that if you have an idea for something, uh, you could create something similar. Um, I'm not sure if I'll have the chance to go into much detail or, or give an example of how to deploy it. Uh, but I'll be sure to discuss that on Wednesday's lecture. Uh, anyway, so that's what I have in store on Wednesday. Uh, and then uh, next Monday will be a, a review, uh, or going over the review for exam three, and then, uh, or that was next Monday. Uh, and then next Wednesday uh, will be uh, the, that third exam. Uh, and then uh, you'll be done with discrete math one for the semester, uh, and uh, <laughs> you'll have a chance to, uh, continue on with the rest of your courses uh, and um, and then you'll be free to do uh, whatever projects you have lined up for the summer. Uh, okay, so um, finishing up, uh, we'll discuss the, the pigeonhole principle and then uh, combinations and, and permutations and R permutations. Uh, and so uh, the pigeonhole principle is, is very straightforward and it doesn't seem terribly interesting uh, at first, but its application is uh, uh, there, there's a little more substance there than, than you would first imagine. Uh, so uh, the theorem uh, is that uh, if you have uh, in just a, a positive number k uh, and you have k plus 1 objects, uh, so it, if you uh, think of it as a, a mailbox or whatever, uh, if you have uh, k letters or k plus 1 letters and k mailboxes um, to put them into, uh, then the pigeonhole principle says that somebody got more than one mail, right? Someone got more than one letter uh, that day. Um, and it's really straightforward. Uh, it was developed by uh, a man named Dirichlet, uh, who was a, a pretty significant figure in, in the history of mathematics, uh, who followed up Gauss, who was a, a slightly more significant figure in mathematics and uh, physics, uh, for those of you that uh, recall uh, electricity and magnetism, Gauss was the one that came up with um, the measurement of, of electric flux. Uh, and so his idea was that if you enclosed something that uh, generated a field that uh, regardless of the shape of that enclosure, um, the, the number of field lines passing through it was the same. Uh, and it uh, anyway, <laughs> that, that is very much tangential. Anyway, so this was developed by Dirichlet, who was the son of a, a mailman, a, a postal worker, basically. Um, and uh, he, he thought of this for that very reason, just the idea that you can't uh, possibly assign k plus 1 distinct elements to k uh, um, mail slots, <laughs> basically. 
Uh, and so um, the, the formalism, the, the corollary that generates from that is that if you have a, a function f, uh, which maps from a set of k plus 1 elements uh, or more, uh, to a set of k elements, then it's not one to one, uh, and it's it's basically the same thing. So you have uh, a bunch of letters, and you have one less mailbox than you have letters. Uh, then you can't do it in a one to one fashion. Something uh, would either be left out, uh, and so it uh, it wouldn't be injective. Uh, uh, not everything would be assigned, right? Uh, or uh, it's um, where something got mapped to to some things or more, <laughs> it, it could be that they're all mapped to the same element, uh, which would be a, a somewhat degenerate function. But um, it's basically all it says. And, and so it, you can think of this as stuffing pigeons into pigeonholes, right, into their little homes where they would stay, and, and two pigeons have to share a home. Uh, or uh, you can think of it as mailboxes, right, uh, which I, I think is what Dirichlet had in mind. Um, and so. Uh, okay, so I, I promised you that there was a little more substance than just that, right? Like, it's such a simple concept. Okay, well, what's the point? Uh, so let's think of this in, in terms of compression, right? Uh, so uh, basically this says that there is... Uh, you'll eventually reach a point where it's as good as possible in terms of compression. Like, you, you can't condense the information down any further. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're, you're going to lose something uh, or... Uh, which is the case whenever you do this mapping, right? Like if um, uh, uh, these these mappings, these functions, uh, if it's not one to one and onto, then it's not invertible, right? Uh, and so in terms of compression, like okay, great, you compressed it down, like <laughs> you compressed this uh, 32 meg file down to just one byte. Um, <laughs> all right, how do we uncompress that? Well, you can't, right? You you lost all that information, right? <laughs> Unless those 32 megs were just the same byte repeated over and over again. Uh, you, you lost the information. There's there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, and even if that was the case, you know, you know, one byte would not be enough to tell you uh, how many times it was even repeated to begin with, right? You can only represent 256 distinct numbers. So even if it was all zeros, you wouldn't know how many zeros it was. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the the underlying inspiration and why the the pigeonhole principle is is relevant to begin with is uh, you know among other things. But um, I, I think the the compression aspect of it is probably the most interesting example. Um, so okay, let's discuss that a little bit. So um, uh, how could we take advantage of this, and and how can we think about the the pigeonhole principle in, in terms of compression and uh, or just think about compression in general. Uh, so uh, if you look at the, the ASCII character set, uh, which is basically all you would typically use whenever sending a, a text message or an email or, or anything else, uh, yeah, if, if you just consider you know, English and, and not really any other additional languages, uh, then you have the just the printable characters to consider, and the ASCII encoding does define a bunch of unprintable characters so um, uh, so those would be ignored in this case um, so you have the the capital letters and the lowercase letters 26 of each so you've used 52 values you have the 10 distinct uh, numeric values 0 through 9 uh, and then you have spaces and punctuation and braces and so forth but even with all of that you're still using less than half of the total number of available slots in, in terms of a byte. Um, so you could define uh, an algorithm where you start considering combinations of characters um, and, uh, and then you could assign those a new value. So uh, if you were to do something uh, similar to, uh, to this, uh, where uh, you, you define a header which uh, defines your mapping and this is a, a hex encoding uh, so uh, bytes that are equal to 0 0 map to A 0 1 maps to B so forth uh, 3 3 maps to lowercase z right so it, it would go this is uh, 51 <laughs> so 0 to 51 um, would cover all of the characters, capital and lowercase, and then you have the punctuation and so forth. 
Um, and so all of that is less than 128. Uh, and then uh, you uh, can start defining more significant things, right? So uh, you discover that, uh, like, if you wanted to compress to, like, gzip compression for uh, sending uh, over HTTP or HTTPS, uh, you're sending uh, HTML pages, uh, it, it would be nice to the network <laughs> if you made your pages as small as possible, and this means compression. Uh, so you'd use something like gzip, and so you go through uh, and you find character sequences that are repeatable, uh, and then you substitute them. So you declare it in the header, uh, and then you replace it, and this is a, a byte 80, right? Uh, and then you could do the same thing with class name divider, right? I'll call that 81, and define that in our header. Uh, and then uh, you really start seeing the benefits whenever uh, it gets reused multiple times, right? So 82. Uh, and so now this, which was, you know, maybe 20 bytes or so, uh, is now represented with just a, a single byte. Uh, right. And it's, you save that every time. Right? So the more repetition there is, the more opportunity there is for, uh, for uh, gains in terms of compression uh, whenever you're compressing text. Uh, and that's basically the idea of what uh, gzip compression is, uh, and uh, LZ compression or, or ping compression uh, for images. Um, but in both cases, you, uh, a fair bit of analysis was done in terms of um, where repeated patterns are and how to represent them in, in some header, something that you can substitute with a, a more compressed value and then replace it later whenever you're decompressing or inflating uh, the uh, the original data, um, but the the pigeonhole principle says that uh, you there's limits to that, right? So uh, whenever you're encrypting data, uh, the idea is to diffuse the information so that it can be any one of you know if if you have uh, something that's you know 32 uh, megabytes long or you know uh, 32 megabytes of information that if it's encrypted, that it can be any one of the uh, 2 to the 8 times 32, or 2 to the 3, uh, whatever, the, the 8 bits times uh, 2 to the 3 times 32 million, right? Uh, combinations, that it can be any one of those. Uh, and in that case, you, know, you can't really compress encrypted data, right? So if you're going to encrypt it uh, and you want compression, you should compress it beforehand because once uh, you get to arbitrary data there's not really enough uh, information there for for repeated patterns uh, at least not if it's a good encryption algorithm um, and so uh, and so uh, it's the reason why whenever like if you have ever tried to gzip or, or zip uh, an image a, a JPEG image or something like that uh, you're not going to have a lot of success. It's it's because it's already been compressed, uh, and then at that point, the only way to make it smaller is to lose information, uh, so to reduce the number of distinct colors and and so forth. But then you can never recover that original information back, um, and that all follows from the pigeonhole principle. Uh, and so uh, I I just thought that would be, you know, an interesting way to consider uh, this this new concept, um, and it's that uh, you know there there is a, a lower bound to how small you can make your information and it's kind of dependent on uh, what that type of information is um, but uh, yeah that, that relationship is there uh, and uh, the pigeonhole principle says that uh, you can't go below a certain value uh, and, but it, it leaves that concept open a little bit uh, but it it's very simply stated uh, anyway uh, so the generalized pigeonhole principle uh, says that uh, if you have n objects and uh, you place them into k boxes, uh, then there's at least one box containing uh, the ceiling of n divided by k objects. Uh, and so, uh, if you uh, so before we said that you had k plus one letters and you're trying to stuff them into k mailboxes, then one of them would have at least or at least one of them would have uh, no fewer than two letters in it. 
uh, if you delivered all the mail for that day. Uh, and so this one says that uh, if you had two times K plus one uh, envelopes and you were trying to stuff them into K mailboxes, uh, then you would have one that was at least 2k plus 1 divided by k uh, that contained at least that many letters. Uh, in that case, that would be 3, right? And so the ceiling function just rounds it up. Uh, and so it's the same idea, but, you know, uh, over and over again. So, uh, so if you had to start reusing them, then uh, that's fine. You can make sure that none of them goes above two, but, uh, you know, once you have 2k plus 1 or more, then you have to start stuffing them with a, a third letter and, and so forth. Uh, and so the idea comes into play whenever you're, you're talking about hash maps and so forth. Uh, and so I think earlier in the semester we discussed how uh, hash maps or, or dictionaries uh, have uh, average of constant time lookups and, and even storage. Um, but uh, it depends on the size of the hash map. Uh, if you uh, start, um, if you start getting significantly more objects and, and trying to stuff them into the hash map, then uh, then the size of the hash map, then it starts to look a lot like uh, a linked list uh, where you're handling collisions and you're continuing to look for items in the sequence uh, to to resolve these collisions. Um, and so again, that that follows from the pigeonhole principle. So, uh, okay, so now that we've discussed that, that super simple concept, right, uh, we can move on to permutations and, and combinations. Uh, and so uh, permutation is a, of a set of distinct objects is an ordered arrangement of these objects. Um, we're also interested in ordered arrangements of some of the elements of a set. An ordered arrangement of R elements of a set is called an R permutation. Uh, okay, uh, so before we were discussing, or I think in the last lecture we discussed, um, selecting uh, the, the product rule and where you're assigning offices and so you have like 11 or 12 offices and three employees um, so uh, how many different ways can you assign three offices to those three employees uh, that's an example of an R permutation uh, where uh, the the set of items is larger than the selection size or, or the assignments um, Anyway, uh, and so uh, you'll see that the theorem that defines the R permutations is uh, a direct interpretation of the product rule, right? So you have n ways to select that first or to assign that first office and n minus one ways to assign that second, n minus two to assign the third, uh, and n minus R plus one to assign that Rth <laughs> office. Uh, and so, um, uh, if uh, if R is equal to N, so if you're assigning 12 offices to 12 employees, uh, then uh, you have um, that uh, uh, the, then you have uh, the product rule applied. Or, uh, sorry, then the product rule uh, basically uh, devolves into uh, the factorial, right? So this would be n factorial if they're exactly equal. Uh, if r is greater than n, uh, then the pigeonhole principle tells us that some people are going to have to start double bunking. Uh, <laughs> at least one office will be shared. Uh, but we'll, for the purposes of this course, we'll only investigate the case where the number of employees is less than the number of offices, or r is less than or equal to n. Right? Uh, okay. Uh, and so a corollary, uh, if uh, n and r are integers where r is less than n, uh, then the number of R permutations is equal to N factorial over N minus R factorial. And so I, I mentioned last time that this was kind of the, the beginnings of uh, what we would see in combinatorics where we have N choose R equal to N factorial over R factorial times N minus R factorial. So let's jump into that. Uh, the number of R combinations uh, of a, a set of N elements um, where N is non-negative and R is in, a non-negative integer as well with r less than n uh, is equal to uh, this formula, this familiar combinations formula, uh, n factorial over r factorial divided by n minus r factorial. Uh, so this part, n factorial over n minus r factorial, is just shorthand for the product rule, which we discussed last time. Right? So mathematicians like to be uh, pithy and, and 
uh, brief. Uh, and so uh, instead of writing this every time, it's just easier to say, uh, okay, so multiply uh, in factorial, right, e each of these terms, uh, and then truncate it. So remove the last r terms um, by dividing by n minus r factorial, right? So really what we're looking for is this, but we write it as this because it's, it's shorter, right? We only want 12 times 11 times 10 when assigning those uh, those uh, three those uh, 12 offices to those three employees right? uh, and so here uh, we say okay well uh, I don't really care who got which office I just need to know which offices have been taken right and so then we also factor out the number of ordered arrangements uh, so who got which office well there's uh, R factorial, or in this case, three factorial, because three employees um, uh, being assigned these offices. And so there's you know uh, three factorial ways that they could have been assigned. I don't care. I just want to know which offices were done, right? Like which combinations there are. Uh, and so that's how this term gets added in as well. We just uh, divide by, by the parity, right? Like we, uh, yeah, that's all that we're looking for. Uh, and, and so uh, this is read uh, in choose R, this notation, uh, and then this is a function, the combinations function in, or uh, in selecting R elements. Uh, okay, uh, so that's it. Uh, you're, you're basically done for the semester. Uh, you know, finish up with the homework and then start preparing for the exam. Uh, but uh, I hope that uh, y'all will... Uh, investigate Wednesday's lecture as well. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that in the broader sense of computer science and software development and, and software architecture and uh, you know uh, uh, all of the appeals of seeing something that, that you might see whenever you, you um, get your first professional job following your uh, completion of your degree program uh, will hold some appeal to you or the idea of that. Um, but if not you know it's kind of an optional lecture so uh, you can wait and, and let the and be surprised whenever you get out there uh, that's also an option you know uh, far be it from me to <laughs> to prevent uh, that surprise from you but um, anyway uh, I, I really uh, enjoyed having you all and uh, I will uh, talk to you all on Wednesday and then uh, again in Monday's review so uh, have a good evening and uh, I'll see you on Wednesday <laughs>